Hi, I'm Johnny. I'm a master's student at the University of Maine. I study weed ecology because weeds are the foremost problem for organic farmers. It's important for us to be able to provide reliable data to farmers to ensure that the tools that they're purchasing work really well. There are a lot of weeding tools out there. That means that we have to be really efficient with the way we conduct our research. That's why we often use what we call surrogate weeds. Surrogate weeds are plants that are bred as crops, which means that we don't have to worry about some of the problems that make conducting research with real weeds difficult, such as higher rates of dormancy or spatial heterogeneity in the field. While surrogates have been used in many studies over the years, there actually hasn't been a study that explicitly compares them to real weeds. We started by assembling four commonly used surrogate weeds and one real weed species, Raphanus raphanestrum, or wild radish. Because wild radish seeds are produced in sleets, that can decrease their rates of germination. So, we husked each seed by hand. Once all of the seeds were ready, we sieved them to make sure that they were all of a uniform size. And then we weighed them using a precision balance. Next, we placed them in petri dishes lined with blotter paper and moistened them with four milliliters of water. Before placing them in an incubator. We then waited about 12 hours for them to germinate. This allowed us to avoid any issues with the seeds not germinating after planting. We then prepared plastic cones in which the plants would grow until they reached either the first, second, or third true leaf stage. We planted the germinated seeds in coarse sand, which a previous experiment had shown to produce plants that were true to life, but more easily cleaned than those grown in field soil. Germinated seeds were then planted at a depth of one centimeter. We irrigated the plants three times a day and fertilized them three times a week. Once each plant reached its designated growth stage, it was subjected to one of two disruptive harvesting methods. Using an Alorus force gauge, we measured each plant's anchorage force, the force required to uproot it from the soil. Those that weren't measured with the force gauge were instead carefully removed from the sand, cleaned, placed in a plexiglass tray, and scanned with a software called Windriser. 
This allowed us to quantify a number of parameters, such as the total length of its roots and the average root diameter. Once they were scanned, each plant was placed in a drying oven for three days before being weighed for dry weight biomass. And now, let's look at the results of the study. When you look at total biomass on a species level, you see that the only significant difference is between two surrogates, Brassica juncea and Sinempis alba, while wild radish is not statistically different from the surrogates. So this would support the hypothesis that surrogates are a viable substitute for wild radish. While there are some differences between surrogates and the wild radish at later leaf stages, there were no significant differences at the first leaf stage, that is, when the first true leaf is fully unfurled, which happens to be when physical weed control is most effective. We also saw this pattern for root length and root surface area. While measuring the anchorage forces of each species, we observed a linear increase before a peak and a number of subsequent stepwise declines, presumably as fine roots broke away. To sum things up, wild radish and the four included brassica surrogate weed species were comparable in a number of parameters of biomass and root architecture. These similarities are especially true at the earlier growth stages, at which physical weed control studies are predominantly conducted. However, significant differences in anchorage force may advocate for caution and further research concerning the use of surrogates for physical weed control studies, especially where uprooting is the primary mode of action.